Look at the roast level on that. Oh yeah. It is pretty light. Sure. <laughs> um, like the coffee. coffee basically was stuck in 1961 and was pre-scientific. When you're making espresso, you're putting hot water into coffee and you want to measure the temperature of that. No one even had any idea what the temperature was. We don't know the temperature of the water, the flow rate of the water, the pressure. No one was measuring anything. Everyone just making up stuff. And so coming in as a technical person to coffee, I thought I can actually make a really big difference. The big problem with extracting espresso is that you've got this puck of, of coffee grounds. And as you're putting water through it, 20% of it's going away. And if it goes away in an uneven way, then that 140 pounds per square inch of pressure is going to drill through that and just water pick through and you're going to have really bad tasting coffee. So this is really the biggest challenge in espresso is how to take this thing that's resisting water and losing 20% of its mass to not go to hell. So the first thing we did was build an instrumented version of this thing where the coffee making happens. And then once we started seeing, okay, what's actually happening at the coffee brewing point, then in here, we had to build something that could do pretty much anything. So any pressure, any temperature, any flow rate really quickly because we didn't know what might be wanted in a couple of years. I went to coffee experts and I said, what should the Tabit software do? How do you want to make coffee? You want faster flow rate? Fine. You want different control of steam? Fine. You want to do this or that? Fine. We said to the people buying it, help us figure out how it should be used. What I really wanted was to attract coffee researchers who had bigger questions like, should the temperature start high and go low? Should we grind finer or coarser? I know these sound really basic. We actually don't know what we want to do. Every other machine out there, when you buy it, it's fixed in time. It will never be more than on the day you buy it. They're made so that the people making it, they believe they know how you should use it. And this machine was made to be open. It's running an open source operating system inside it. Not only does it look like a computer that makes coffee, it is a computer that makes coffee. Because it's software based, it evolves. When you buy this machine, you're kind of looking to the future. You're saying, what does it do now? But also, where is it going? One of the things I really believe is that virtually all contributions to these sorts of projects happen in an evening. When I was young, I was living in New Haven around Yale University, and I very early on realized I just wasn't that smart that people around me were just way smarter. And I only started to achieve success when I found a way to get those really smart people to work with me on projects. So for me, openness was the secret sauce to get the best people on the planet to come join your project and do something that totally transcends my own limitations. The forum which is called The Decent Diaspora. It's all these people who have the same gear, just helping each other make better coffee. It was like 300 to 500 messages a day where people are arguing this stuff. And programmers and coffee people are batting it back and forth and doing revisions. No matter what your skill set is, you could contribute in some way. You could help someone who's just starting out get their grind right, or you could have them try something different, or you could change a graphic or whatever. Right now, I'd say we have dozens of people collaborating. So that openness in data, openness and visibility, the sharing has made the product really improve very quickly. There's a coffee researcher named Jonathan Gagne who wrote a book called The Physics of Filter Coffee. He kind of glommed on to our machine as one that actually measured. And he would come up with a theory and then all of us would scratch our heads and go, how can we do that? No one's ever thought of that thing before. I tried to implement Jonathan's ideas about the software. What actually happened is it made better coffee, but it didn't make optimal coffee. 
And then the next stage happened. A programmer, coffee researcher named Damien said, I know what's needed. A specialized instrument that is basically optimized for doing Jonathan Gagne experiments needs to be programmed. And then he goes and programs that. So over the next few years, the frontier is gonna keep getting pushed of more coffees that taste great, but also more coffee out of less coffee beans, better coffee out of lower quality coffee, different varieties of coffee that haven't been used before. So even if you don't plan on being an innovator, if you wanna catch the wave, you're gonna to have to have this machine. The biggest philosophical influence on me is a guy named Buckminster Fuller. I've got to understand how to produce artifacts out of the, in, in the transformings of nature's energy. And these artifacts then will bring about environmental differences that completely alter the circumstances of humanity. He originally thought that he quite arrogantly could just invent things that were better ways. People would recognize the better way and take them on. In fact, he said, if you want to change the world, don't attack the problem head on. Invent a better way and people will follow you. And that sounds right, but actually it's wrong. They won't follow you. They, they got to be motivated. They got to be marketed to, cajoled. They have to have a good short-term reason for, for following. The kind of ways that he started to succeed is at the very end of his life, he seems to have realized that this wasn't going to happen and that he actually needed to build a movement. And actually the legacy of Buckminster Fuller is people who have taken his ideas and then actually made them happen. The greatest impact of his life is going to be the followers, not his direct creative fruits. Buckminster Fuller is a huge influence on me, both for his philosophy, but also for ultimately his failure in being largely unable to change the world. And, you know, in 10 years, I'm going to be in retirement. And if this thing is going to do well, I need to have followers who run with it and, and, and keep it going in ways that I never thought of. So that's my task right now. The short-term goal of selling machines so that we have a business, but the long-term goal so that this thing survives my retirement.